China is an ancient civilization, and Nanking its ancient cultural and political center. According to Chinese legend, the earth and the sky were created by Bangu, primal man. The wind was created from his breath, and the thunder from his voice. Bangu's tears formed the two great rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze. Nanking lies along the Yangtze River. Nanking was the capital of China from the 3rd to 6th century. In the 14th century, when Hung Wu became the first Ming emperor, Nanking again became the nation's capital. To protect his political power base, Hung Wu erected the largest city wall in the world. The city wall stood 50 feet high, 40 feet wide, and was more than 25 miles long. An entire army was needed to defend its circumference. The city gates were great fortifications, each containing a series of gates so that once an enemy broke through, they would be faced with yet another gate and could be surrounded on all sides from above and then destroyed. Although China and Nanking had repeatedly suffered from internal war and strife, and although gunpowder had been invented in China, in its 4,000 year history, the people of China had never invaded a foreign land. China had always been self-sufficient and for its entire history, needed nothing from other countries and took nothing. In a land of Buddhist priests and where Confucian thought was the norm, to wage war on one's foreign neighbors was not part of the Chinese character. In the 1920s, whereas the nearby port city of Shanghai had become the financial center of China, Nanking had again become the capital. Nanking shared a relationship with Shanghai much like the relationship between Washington, D.C. and New York City. Nanking was a city of breathtaking towers, pagodas, temples, museums, monuments, ancient imperial palaces and tombs that was still surrounded by the largest city wall in the world. In 1937, Nanking, with a population of over 1.3 million, was a city of the old and the new, of electricity and candlelight, of paved highways and dirt roads. Buses and automobiles competed with mule carts and rickshaws and crowds of people and animals which filled the streets, where water flowed from indoor plumbing and which could still be purchased by the bucket in the streets. On August 13, 1937, Japanese bombs began to fall on Shanghai and Nanking. Japanese pilots bombed power plants, government buildings, churches, hospitals, and schools. For centuries, Japanese children were taught that their emperor was an omnipotent god who is destined to rule the world. The most popular toys were toy soldiers, rifles, bugles, helmets, and military uniforms. The warrior ideal and the molding of men to become soldiers who were to die in the service of the emperor also began in boyhood. The education system became dedicated to the way of war and children were taught that it was their duty to fight for Japan and to conquer China. Children were also taught to hate the Chinese and that it was their duty to become soldiers and to someday conquer and kill the Chinese people. It was the duty of every Japanese citizen to display robotic, soldierly obedience and unconditional loyalty to the emperor, who was the son of heaven.
In 1868, the Sun cult of Shinto became Japan's state religion, headed by the emperor. By imperial decree, the samurai ethic of Bushido, the way of the warrior, became the moral code for all Japanese citizens. War was sacred and a way to glorify their god. To die for the emperor was considered to be the highest honor and a way to achieve glory. To die for the emperor is to live forever. The Sun Cult of Shinto holds that only the emperor and his descendants are created in God's image. Every male citizen was taught that Japan was a divine country of gods and that the emperor was a god and that all individual life, including their own life, was worthless. According to Shinto military and religious belief, the Japanese emperor was destined by divine right to rule the world. On July 25, 1927, the Tanaka Memorial was presented to Japanese Emperor Hirohito by Premier Baron Gichi Tanaka. The Tanaka Memorial laid out a well-reasoned military plan to conquer the world, beginning with Manchuria, then China, then all of Asia, then India, Russia, Europe, and the world. According to the Tanaka Memorial, in order to conquer the world, we must first conquer China. Every Japanese patriot believed that Japan had to first conquer China as a prelude to the conquest of all Asia and the domination of the world. Since the Japanese emperor was an omnipotent god, to admit that his divine rule extended only to Japan would be a denial of his omnipotence, and the whole theory on which Japan was governed would crash to the ground. In July of 1937, Japan began a full-scale invasion of China. On August 13, 1937, Japanese bombs began to fall on Shanghai and Nanking. Japanese warplanes and naval ships concentrated on bombing civilian targets, hoping to terrorize the Chinese people into submission. On August 15, Chiang Kai-shek issued a general mobilization order and made himself commander of the Chinese Army and Navy. Seven hundred thousand Chinese troops were ordered to defend Shanghai. In August, they began slugging it out with the Japanese.
For weeks then months, the Japanese concentrated on bombing civilian targets, killing tens of thousands of innocent Chinese. Despite their superior weaponry, the Japanese found it embarrassingly difficult to dislodge the Chinese or to make significant progress in their attempt to conquer Shanghai. The Japanese intensified the air and naval bombardment of Shanghai and began encircling the city with reinforcements. Chinese defenses began to crumble. In November of 1937, after three months of fighting, the Nationalist Chinese Army, which had so far lost 300,000 men, 10 generals, and every major battle, retreated from Shanghai, intending on regrouping in Nanking. All Chinese soldiers who had surrendered or were captured, and tens of thousands of Chinese men and boys, were subsequently rounded up and murdered by the Japanese. With the fall of Shanghai, there were ecstatic celebrations in Japan, and the Tokyo stock market soared. With the fall of Shanghai, the victorious Japanese army began its march towards Nanking and laid waste to the countryside. Villages and cities were burned, civilians were cruelly murdered, and women were raped and tortured. Many villages and cities, including Songjian, with a pre-war population of 100,000, became ghost towns after every citizen had been killed. On November 19th, Su Chao, a city of 350,000, was captured. There followed mass killings. Villages were surrounded and then set on fire at night, the Japanese soldiers shooting and killing everyone who tried to escape. Mothers with babies, old women and little girls were raped and mutilated or burned alive. Women who were young or attractive were branded and taken captive and became little more than sexual slaves to serve as Japanese soldiers and officers as they marched onward to Nanking. As they marched to Nanking, most of these women were raped by hundreds of Japanese soldiers before being killed and discarded along the roadside. Every soldier was in fact promised a woman if he fought hard and if he killed lots of Chinese. Wu Xi, Hangzhou, many other cities and countless towns and villages were all savaged as well. Mothers with babies, children, old men and pregnant women all were tortured, beheaded, bayoneted, or burned alive. The Japanese in fact made a game of it, beheading and bayoneting helpless farmers, old men, and little boys.
It has been estimated that 300,000 civilians were murdered by the Japanese on their march from Shanghai to Nanking. With the fall of Shanghai, air attacks over Nanking increased in severity. Nanking was bombed on a daily basis for over 100 days. Most of the bombs fell on non-military targets, including Nanking Central Hospital, which had a large red cross painted on its rooftop. Southern Nanking, the most densely populated area of the city, suffered the worst bombings. The bombings began at 9.30 in the morning and lasted until 4.30 in the evening. The Chinese were not completely helpless. German anti-aircraft batteries repeatedly fired back at the Japanese planes, sending more than a few crashing to earth. By the end of November 1937, tens of thousands of refugees and over 90,000 demoralized Chinese soldiers had arrived in the city. These were not the elite troops, most of whom had been killed defending Shanghai. Rather, many were 12 and 13 year old boys, as well as farmers who had been forced into the army at the point of a gun. Many of these recruits had never even fired a weapon. The Japanese army was close behind. Chinese soldiers began digging in to defend the city. Furious fighting broke out in the suburbs of Nanking in the first week of December 1937. Despite continual Japanese bombardment, which decimated Chinese forces, the Chinese repeatedly launched fierce counterattacks and prevented the Japanese from advancing for almost three days. December 2nd, 1937, 
Emperor Hirohito removed General Matsui from his command and replaced him with Prince Asaka, who became commander-in-chief of the army, attacking Nanking. Thus, the attacking Japanese armies were under the direct command of the royal family, who would thus receive much of the glory for destroying the capital of China. Prince Asaka, who was Hirohito's uncle, thus had more power than any other general. Asaka had every intention of using his power to terrorize the Chinese and all of Asia into submission. On December 5th, Prince Asaka issued his first order upon being informed that the Japanese army was about to surround 300,000 Chinese soldiers. Kill all captives. There was now furious debate among Chinese generals as to the wisdom of defending the capital. Many Chinese generals, as well as their German advisors, argued that it was impossible to successfully defend Nanking. Chiang Kai-shek became paralyzed with indecision. Unable to decide if Nanking should be defended or abandoned, he decided to do both. Chiang Kai-shek would abandon the city, along with his wife and top generals. He nevertheless declared that Nanking must be defended. Yet rather than stay and fight, he instead assigned the defense of Nanking to his rival, General Tang. Tang was instructed to fight to the death. General Tang accepted the challenge. Chiang Kai-shek then made Tang's task impossible and thus set the course for the greatest military disaster in China's history. Chiang Kai-shek ordered all government and municipal officials to evacuate, taking with them trucks and all municipal means of transportation. They also removed all communications equipment and gutted the communications ministry, thus making it impossible for General Tang to effectively communicate with his officers or his soldiers who were digging in to defend the city. On December 8th, Chiang Kai-shek and his wife and their advisors fled from the city by plane. They were followed by the entire Chinese Air Force. Coupled with the loss of all communications equipment, made it impossible for General Tang to obtain or communicate any details on Japanese troop movement. Chiang Kai-shek had rendered General Tang deaf and blind. Upon learning that Chiang Kai-shek was abandoning the city, tens of thousands of citizens also began to depart even as refugees from the countryside continued to stream into the city. As the Japanese advanced and attacked the city, most of the foreign nationals departed Nanking. John Raby, a member of the Nazi party and an executive with Siemens Electric Company, was one of the few foreign nationals who decided to stay. John Raby organized and became chairman of an international committee for the Nanking Safety Zone, the Nazi flag served as their talesman for protection. The International Safety Zone was divided into 10 sectors and included Raby's home, four streets, and about two square miles of the city. It is estimated that over 200,000 men, women, and children crowded into the safety zones, many of them wild-eyed women who feared being raped and murdered by the Japanese. The Nazi flag provided some semblance of protection for the more than 200,000 people crowded within the safety zones, as the Japanese were in fact allied with the Nazis. The American flag offered no such protection. As Western diplomats crowded upon the American ship Panay, docked outside Nanking, the ship came under attack by Japanese fighters and bombers. The Panay was sunk after a short but furious battle. The bombing of Nanking also continued from morning until night, with the Japanese dropping over 500 bombs each day, mostly on civilian targets.
December 10th, although they had resisted furiously, Chinese losses became insurmountable and their defenses began crumbling. On December 11th, the Japanese army advanced from the suburbs and began their assault on the city, in many places breaching Nanking's protective walls. Fighting was now taking place in many parts of the city. On the afternoon of December 11th, in the heat of battle, General Tang received an astonishing message from Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was ordering Tang to retreat. Tang argued a retreat was impossible. His troops were in the midst of a furious battle, and they were nearly completely surrounded by Japanese soldiers. Tang begged Chiang Kai-shek to reconsider, arguing that it was impossible to transmit these orders to the majority of the Chinese defenders of the city. Chiang Kai-shek gave the order a second time. Chinese soldiers were to retreat from the city and Tang was to abandon the city and his troops. On December 12th, Tang complied as did all of his officers, many of whom never bothered to inform the Chinese troops who were still fighting. Tang and his officers began slipping away even as most of their men continued to fight. Some Chinese troops, however, learned that a retreat had been ordered. They too began abandoning their posts. Many of the other soldiers believed they were witnessing mass desertions and continued to fight even as large portions of the now leaderless army were frantically seeking to escape from the city. But there was no escape. They were completely surrounded. Nanking had become a giant trap for Chinese soldiers and Chinese civilians. On the morning of December 13th, Japanese forces began streaming into the city. They immediately began shooting into the crowds of refugees as they ran in fear down the streets. Chinese soldiers began frantically discarding their weapons and uniforms, hoping to blend in with the citizens of Nanking as they made their escape. The fleeing crowds were chased by Japanese soldiers who shot at them from behind and then surrounded them with machine guns, killing them all. Unarmed Chinese men, women, children, and Chinese soldiers began running for their lives, hoping to storm the locked city gates and flee to safety across the Yangtze River. Instead, they became trapped and were surrounded by the Japanese, who used cannon, machine guns, rifles, and grenades to kill everyone. The roads and alleyways were awash with blood and flesh, and corpses were strewn throughout the streets. It was a nightmarish scene of death and utter chaos. In yet other parts of the city, Chinese soldiers continued to fight, killing and being killed in furious house-to-house -house battles, until they too were overrun. Then they too began to run for their lives, seeking desperately to climb over the city walls to safety, only to be massacred as they ran. The city had fallen. The slaughter continued until not a soul could be found on the streets. In Japan, there were great celebrations over the great victory and destruction of Nanking, the capital of China. The Tokyo stock market soared.
Nanking had been reduced to a smoldering ruin of death and despair. Little did the people know that the nightmare of Nanking was about to begin. <laughs>